la 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 la. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey. Two, 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 two. Two, 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 two. Hey, 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 hey.
it's absolutely lovely to be here. Warm welcome, and uh, well done for getting up early. Uh, particular well done to the first five people in the room who Lulu's given uh, edge mugs and sweets. If you didn't come for the first five this time, you know for next time that there are prizes available. We couldn't resist doing a little Steve Jobs style walk on because this is such a classy venue, we're not used to this. So I was like, yeah, let, let's go for it, let's embrace that. Um, so yeah, what could be better with your breakfast than talking about the really important area of skill shortages, the current economy, the future economy. We've got an absolutely fantastic panel. Um, what we're going to do, first of all, is have three presentations. Um, unfortunately, our lovely colleague Lisa is not very well this morning, so I'm going to stand in for her and say a little bit about NFER's work. Um, but I've got Phil and LJ to talk about their research first. Then we're going to have a bit more of an informal panel with some responses from uh, my colleagues Naomi, James, and Kat, um, and then open it for discussion and we'll take a few questions. So we're going to keep it nice and relaxed, um, and uh, we're going to hopefully have some really interesting content to, to share with you. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Phil Kenmore, who is Director of Corporate Development and Partnerships at the Open University to talk about their landmark work on the Business Barometer. Over to you. Thanks, Ollie. Appreciate it. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, hope you're well. Thanks for joining us this morning. As Ollie says, really nice to see you all um, at early doors, as it were. So I'm going to talk a bit about some research we did at the Open University called the Business Barometer. Um, it's the sixth year we've done it, um, so we've been doing it for a while. Um, and we did it this year with the British Chambers of Commerce, and uh, we did a, a survey in the spring. Um, just before I talk about it, let me just say a couple of words about the Open University. I'm sure you've all heard of the brand, I hope. Um, the Open University is the largest education institution in higher education in the UK. We have 200,000 students. We're a four nations university. Um, our mission is to be open to people, places, methods and ideas. So we exist, we actually exist in order to give people opportunities in higher education that they wouldn't otherwise get from every community and every background and every type of person who wants to study in higher education. That's why we exist. Um, a very large proportion of our students come from deprived areas. We have 37,000 students who declare a disability, more students declaring disability than most universities have students, um, and 7 out of 10 of our students are in work, so they're supporting families and others whilst they're studying as well. And hopefully some of you in the room would have been OU students um, as well and had good experience. So let me just talk a little bit about the business barometer that we, we set up this year. As I say, we did it with the British Chambers of Commerce. We did a survey of about 1,300 employers back in the spring, April, May time it was. So. It was before the real impact of the Ukraine war had hit us. It was before the cost of living crisis had really, really bitten. It was before the recent political chaos and the impact that's had on the economy. And of course, we've got the autumn statement this morning, which itself will have quite a lot of impact on all of us. So it was before those things. Um, and the messaging was not entirely positive, let's put it that way. So I'm going to talk to you about the results of that survey today, and I think we should all probably put it in the context of where we are today, and some of the things I'll mention have probably got slightly worse and slightly better. It feels slightly awkward for me, because I'm a very glass-half-full sort of person, um, but as we stand here today and we think about you know, what's coming for us in the next couple of years, we need to put it in that context and actually just think about what that means for businesses and organisations in the UK economy. So the survey is primarily about skill shortages and about the skill shortages people face and the impact it's having on their organisations. And so... One of, the key founding, foundings, one of the key findings we had from this was that 68% of the organisations that responded to us said that skill shortages were already having an impact on their organisations. This is back in, in April, May time. Now, interestingly, that was particularly the case for SMEs. SMEs were struggling particularly with the skill shortages. Large organisations said they had the same impact in terms of 86% said they were feeling skill shortages, but they felt they had more... Um, strategies to deal with those skill shortages and they were trying to deal with them in more varied ways than SMEs, than SMEs perhaps had the opportunity to do. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Of those large organisations, 53% had planned to continue and increase their investment in training. This was back in April, May when we did the survey. So over half of them had planned to continue to increase their investment in training. And we'll talk a bit about apprenticeships um, going forward. In the SMEs, it was a bit lower, about 47% that said they would continue to invest in training. So SMEs were struggling slightly more than the large organisations. We asked specifically, though, as well, about the impact of remote learning, because we were really interested as we came out of the pandemic what the impact of remote learning was for these organisations. Now, really interestingly, 42%, um, or a large chunk of, of the, the size of the organisations, the big organisations with more than 250 employers, 
employees has said that they felt that remote working had helped them attract people to their businesses, to their organisations. They felt that the ability to offer remote working was allowing them to attract people that they wouldn't previously have attracted. And of course the ability to attract people from different geographies as opposed to geography where they were necessarily centred uh, in terms of their base um, organisation. And I think we've all, a lot of us have experienced that. We've experienced it, for example, in our organisation, the Open University, where we're based largely on Milton Keynes with offices in, in the other nations. But we've been able to attract people that aren't within commuting distance of one of our offices now. And I think a lot of large organisations have felt that. One of the key challenges the evidence showed, though, was that for SMEs, that is not the case. Only 12% of SMEs felt that remote working was helping them attract more staff. And I think some of that is because of the nature of some of those businesses and the nature of how they work and their business model. And they were struggling to offer remote working in the same way that large organisations were able to do. Perhaps they didn't have the resources, perhaps the nature of their business model meant they wanted people to be on site um, or close to them. And that meant they had a distinct disadvantage in overcoming staff shortages and skill shortages in some ways and attracting those people to them compared to the large organisations. And that is a bit of an issue for SMEs in most parts of the UK, to be honest. So what are the impact of the skills shortages? What did we find? What did we see? Well, 72% reported that the impact of skills shortages were having on them, this is back in the spring, was having a significant detrimental effect on their work, the work level of their other staff and also the health and well-being of their staff. So in other words, the skills shortages were already having an impact on the rest of the organisation, the people that were there and were working. And that's a very large proportion, particularly when it comes to affecting health and well-being of staff. And I think we all know we've, we've had some challenges recruiting and retaining staff around health issues as well. You look at the drop in the workforce numbers for the economy as a whole. 46% had had reduced output and productivity as a result of skills shortages. So nearly half of the employers we spoke to had already seen a reduction in productivity and output because of skills shortages which is a very significant proportion, I think, when you think of the, the, in, the uh, efficiency and economy issues we have already. Nearly 40% had found that their delivering operating times, their ability to deliver for their customers had slowed down. They'd actually got slower in terms of how they were delivering for customers. And 36% had already seen a reduction in their long-term growth plans because they had, they had already seen their ability to grow in the future beyond one year was already detrimentally affected and they were planning for slower growth. And this, of course, was back in April and May, as I say, um, before um, the current problems. What we found was interesting as well was that in terms of pro profitability and the output of that skill shortage, the result of that skill shortage, over a third were already, reduced, already saying they had reduced profitability in their business. So they were already experiencing reduced profitability because of skill shortages that they had in their business. And that, of course, is going to have a detrimental effect on those organisations as they plan to invest for future skills and their ability to do so, which I think we, you know, we found was particularly worrying. And 28% had turned down work or turned down the opportunity to bid for work because they didn't believe they would be able to deliver it to the customer's requirements, either in the timeline or to the extent of the requirement from the customer. So 28% were already reducing the amount of work they were bidding for, and that, of course, will have a knock-on effect going forward for those organisations. So the impact of those skill shortages, it's not, it's not a great picture, to be honest. It was a little bit of, of you know, doom and gloom for some of those organisations, and particularly hard hit, as I say, with the SMEs. And this was before some of the current um, economic problems. Now, I wanted to pull out two other stats from the, the, the report. And quite often in these, re these bits of research, we all focus on, on the big numbers and the things that I've just talked about with like, the headline numbers. But to me, there were two other stats that came out that were particularly worrying when we think about the future of how our economy and how our businesses will grow and will drive growth in this economy. One was that 12% of those employers that we spoke to were already reporting their ability to deliver on diversity, equality and inclusion goals was reduced and they didn't believe they were going to deliver those goals. So that's 12% back in April and May. Now I find that quite worrying. At that stage that's already a significant proportion and of course as the economic climate perhaps worsens that's likely to get more impactful as well in terms of delivering for the diversity, equality and, and and inclusion goals. 10% were saying the same thing about environmental sustainability and governance goals. So 10% were already saying their ability to deliver on their environmental sustainability and governance goals was already compromised. And again, that's quite a worrying stat because again, the impact of that in the future as we reach forward, that could potentially get worse as well. 
So I'm sorry to start the, uh, the breakfast session with a little bit of doom and gloom, and I'm going to try and, and, and lift it a little bit. There, was, there were some strong messages that we came out. We think things people can do. And this actually think this applies as much now as we look forward to potentially the next economic cycle. We know we're going to have a recession in two years, hopefully a shallow one. And we know, of course, those of us that have worked and lived through previous recessions know that actually we always emerge from it and there are opportunities in a recession. I was involved in some work just after the 2008 financial crash looking at how companies came out of that positively and how they developed for growth post that crash period. And of course, some companies did extremely well. And the companies that did extremely well were the ones that planned for that post-recessional period and trained their people for it. So it's not surprising that some of our advice from the research that we've done is that organizations should absolutely plan for a post-recession period, should plan now for what their skills uh, needs are going to be and how do they build into their investment, what investment they do make, and it will be limited, but how do they build into that investment the upskilling and reskilling of their people and the training they need to do for the future post-recession. The other thing we would say is consult, benchmark, talk to others. Talk to other people in your industry, talk to BCC, talk to higher education providers and others. Talk to people about what others are doing and think about how you can connect and engage with them in terms of sharing some of the load. And the final thing I would say really is make sure you make absolute use of your apprenticeship levy. The apprenticeship levy and the opportunity for apprenticeships is huge and will continue to be even during a difficult economic period. Reskilling, upskilling your staff or existing staff is the route to planning for post-recession. The apprenticeship levy will definitely help you do that. So I would definitely say cast your eyes to your levy and how you use it. Thank you. Bill, thank you so much for getting us off to such a great start. I'm also a glass half full person, so it was difficult listening to the first half, um, but I appreciate that um, you know, that is where we are, and obviously today's uh, statement is going to be you know, particularly interesting and relevant on that. Um, just to pick up a few points that I, that I heard that we'd love to kind of back, come back to kind of during the discussion. So I think this point about SMEs is really important. Um, it's come up in lots of conversations we've had recently, particularly around the skills system, the fact that sometimes it's designed around some of the bigger businesses that are spending time in Whitehall, um, and it's really challenging. We were talking particularly about creative industries recently and how, how that's you know, predominantly micro businesses, um, and that can be a real, real challenge. So I'd love to come back to that point. Um, your point about remote working, the, the kind of opportunities it's given, and we've now got two associate members of staff in San Diego and Berlin, which would never have happened before, so that's great, um, but also some of the challenges as well. Um, and I thought your point about the impact on existing staff and stress, and that's something that LJ will probably pick up because that's a strong finding from the Youth Voice Sciences as well. Um, not forgetting diversity and sustainability um, in, in the kind of rush. And just that point about opportunities at the end, I think, is really, really powerful. Um, when I was doing some work on apprenticeships, again, we looked at some of the businesses that had, had, had invested in young people as apprentices in the previous recession, and then seen really kind of strong growth afterwards. So um, I really hope that that, that happens. Just to, just to come back to that point about SMEs, though, before we move on, just tell us a little bit more about some of the differentiation there, and maybe anything that you'd like to see change in the skill system to make things a bit easier for, for SMEs. Yeah, and it was, it's really interesting to do some distinction between SMEs and large organisations because not all the research does do that, and we thought that was really important. Um, we did also, by the way, um, cut the data by the four nations. So if you, want to, if you do look at the report and download it, there's data cut by four nations, and that's available as well. Um, I think the challenge for SMEs is, is that they don't have the resources available that large organisations have. And I think the skill shortages are, are making... People are very, very picky now about where they're going, obviously. At this current point in time, it's been certainly an employee-driven market rather than employer-driven market. We might see that shift a little bit in the recession, I don't know. Some employees, of course, or people entering the workforce, see safety in large organisations, and SMEs struggle with that. So I think one of the things that we picked up as well is that SMEs should work quite hard on their brand and how they position their employer brand, I mean. So I mean the employer brand. And how they position the opportunities for working in their organisation and their sector. And lots of the SMEs we've spoken to have talked a lot about how they connect with the sector and how they use their sector connections to almost build, amongst their competitors, to build a draw-in of skill and talent and do some of it together. So we've seen, for example, on some of the apprenticeships where SMEs come together and are, they might have individual apprentices, but they're positioning together as a cohort around an industry. And we deliver a cohort of apprentices for an industry that will be across a range of 20 or 30 SMEs. And that's a really good way of them getting the benefit together and building a skill set across the industry. Mm, that's great, Bill. And um, obviously, online training is one of the kind of key kind of yeah. factors in your organization. But kind of yeah. thinking about that element, the kind of skills side moving online during the pandemic, do you think there are, I mean, I guess my worry is that there's been a bit of a missed opportunity there in other organizations that people went online in, with the best will in the world during lockdown. They were like, we're going to keep the best of this 
and then yes. it's kind of finished and everyone's pretty much gone back. Is, there, is, there kind of, is that your feeling as well, or am I being uh, No, that, that, I think that that? Is, there is some truth in that. I think what we've seen is that um, some of the shift to online was what I would say very, is very basic, is taking a PowerPoint presentation, sticking it online, and being able to read it. Um, obviously, some other providers, and I would say this wouldn't I, because I'm from the Open University, we, we design curriculum to do delivered online in a supported environment. It's designed for that context, which is very different. And I think some of the best education providers and training providers have, have made that shift. And I think if you're looking for education training that is either online or I would say blended, because you need the practical skills and you need the academic and other content, make sure that the, the content being delivered online is designed to be delivered in that way. Mm. That's how it's been created. That's what I would look for. That's a great tip and probably something that's transferable to online work as well in the sense that Absolutely. we shouldn't just be moving existing job types online. We should be thinking about the advantages. The nature of, of work and how we want people to work. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. Really strong start. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank um, you. LG, I'd like to welcome you to the stage next to give the young people's perspective. Excellent. I'm going to stay put, if that's Absolutely right. fine. You're welcome. Cool. Um, I don't think you should ever be in charge of a party, because I'm not going to lift the mood. So <laughs> I'm just warning everybody not to have Ollie organise anything for you um, socially. Uh, so my name is Laura Jane Rawlings. I'm the Chief Executive of Youth Employment UK, which is a not-for-profit organisation that was set up back in the last recession of 2011 to tackle youth unemployment. Um, so here we are. feels a bit like Groundhog Day and Deja Vu um, in, in the work that we're doing for and with young people. Um, youth Employment UK spans, spans a whole spectrum in terms of looking to understand the issues and the views as told to us by young people themselves. Um, it's one of kind of the unique approaches to our work is to really get into that conversation with young people. What are their real barriers? How are they really experiencing the systems around them? So that when we come to working with our policy colleagues, when we come to working and advising government or with employers, we're doing that very much through the lens of young people and what they are telling us works for them and what they tell us absolutely doesn't work for them. And over the last five years, we've been doing that more formally in a piece of work called the Youth Voice Census, which is a huge survey of formerly 16 to 24 year olds. Now, this year in 2022, we expanded that age range to 11 to 30 year olds. And it's a, a massive question set, exploring with those young people that take part, all of their experiences from the place that they live, um, through to their experiences in school, college, training, apprenticeships, being unemployed, and being in work. And so it gives us this incredible temperature check, an important temperature check, of really where young people are at today. And I think it's very easy for us working hard in policy, and my God, have we worked hard in policy in the last 10 years, um, to forget our young people, to, to look at this audience, this group as a number, as a homogenous group. And certainly what we're able to do with the Youth Voice Census is bring to life those stories, those individual experiences, and, and really put that forward and that case forward for why we can't just continue to assume we know what young people want and what they need. They have to have a seat at the table. And at Youth Employment UK, they've had a seat at the table for 10 years. So um, we call ourselves experts in this space. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Youth Voice Census 2022 findings. The report was launched in September this year um, and um, I'm delighted and grateful always for the support of the EDGE Foundation amongst our other sponsors who help us complete this massive piece of work and this huge undertaking. Um, and really exciting, they got the front page of the Evening Standard last week. So it's also a piece of work now that's being used far and wide to influence and to speak to policymakers, employers right across the country. So the Youth Voice Census in 2022 was opened in March this year and closed in April, May time, um, and was a point in which we collected over 4,000 responses, which is quite incredible given that the volume of questions that we ask young people and, and um, testament to their commitment to wanting to be heard and to have a voice on some of these issues. Um, the volume this year allowed us to um, weight that data and to ensure that similar sections in the census are representative of that population of young people. We can't do that with all of the sections of the Youth Voice Census because not all young people who took part in the census have been through an apprenticeship or have been through university. So those sections, um, valuable, are not weighted. So I'm going to just talk about some of the key findings. 
It is a 160-page report, um, so I welcome you to go and read it. Ollie's given me nine and a half minutes, I think, so um, I'm going to do this whistle-stop. Um, we do have some briefing packs with us. I'm hoping you remembered them on the train this morning. Excellent, Josh. So if you want to grab from us um, this morning, we can share some, with, um, some further data with you on this report. So the four key findings this year were the mental health emergency. What was really stark this year more than ever before was that for every age group, and remember this survey went out to 11 to 30 year olds, however we cut that data this year, every age group has cited that their mental health and anxiety is going to be one of their biggest barriers to work. But the mental health and the anxiety issue that our young people are facing is so profound, it's almost debilitating them from making next step choices. They don't want to get it wrong, and so they don't know where to go or how to make those choices. And it, this is, we've seen this trend grow in the last five since I. I remember in the first one, mental health was kind of in the top 10 findings, but certainly not in the top five. And we're now at a point five years later where it is first and most acutely seen by young people. And of course, this is because we've had COVID. Young people were so severely affected by COVID, and, and I recognize and empathize that all of us were. But for some of our young people, they had their entire lives pulled from underneath them with no explanation. There wasn't a briefing from our government talking to young people about their education opportunities that they'd missed, about the opportunity for catch-up that would be provided to them, young people who would have been transitioning through GCSEs and A-levels had that entire future pulled out from underneath them. A future that the system had been telling them was their rite of passage to their next step. Gone. On top of that, what we heard from young people, of course, was that they also then didn't get the careers education support that they would have had had they been in school, and they certainly didn't get work experience, which also they would have had had they been in school. At the same time, our retail and our hospitality sectors were shut down, so for a huge cohort of young people, there was no work experience for two, three years of the most important times of their lives, where then employers of the future were going, so tell me about your work experience, Ollie. They didn't have any. So it's really, really important that we understand that experience that young people had through COVID and the impact it's having. And I genuinely don't feel that we'll really ever understand that impact for another five, maybe 10 years as we see kind of the further final cohorts who were affected through education finish um, that period of their study. So mental health and anxiety was of course affected by COVID. But young people aren't adverse to reading the news. They're, they're not oblivious to what's going on. They're hearing about wars. They're hearing about the cost of living. Um, my 14-year-old keeps saying to me, Mummy, I can't wait for inflation to stop so you'll decorate my room. I mean, I may have overplayed the role inflation has in decorating her room, but our young people are hearing us talk. They're hearing the news, and it is having a direct effect on their mental health and their well-being. And the services for mental health and well-being have never been under more pressure and have never been more underfunded. And hands up if you think the Chancellor is going to invest in our mental health services today. So what are we doing about that? That's a question mark we've got to come back to at some point. The second key finding, and, and this was the one that I think made me the most sad about the country in which we live. Um, this year, we were able to work with Stonewall to really unpick how we might talk to young people from the LGBTQ plus community. We've done a lot of work to ensure that the census reached and supported young people from black, Asian, and ethnic minority groups in years before, those in the disability, those care leavers. We've done a lot of work to, to help those young people take part. This year, we really worked with Stonewall to make sure that those in the LGBTQ plus community could take part in the census. And I sort of wish they hadn't, but it's important that we know that they had, because what we heard from those young people who already are part of this generation of anxiety and having mental health and being concerned about their future, was that if you are different in the UK, you are disadvantaged. So whether you're from a black, Asian, if not an ethnic minority background, whether you're from LGBTQ, whether you're from a care leaver background, whether you are um, a young person in um, free school meals and, and living in poverty, amongst all of your peers, you are the most disadvantaged. And we saw that uh, play out then as young people told us about the amount of experiences that they'd had, the amount of careers, activities they'd had, the amount of work experience exposure. Those young people weren't just telling us they were demonstrating within data sets that they were getting less opportunity. 
which no doubt explains why young people do not feel prepared for their future, which was the third key finding. They don't feel they can write CVs, they don't feel they can come to assessment centres, they don't know how to look for jobs, because the careers education system, which has never been great, is still not working as well for all young people. And those young people that sit outside of the education system, what chance do they have? And they don't feel they have any chance because on top of that, despite the highest number of vacancies over the last 12 months we've ever seen, young people are, don't feel that they can find quality work where they live. They're not seeing these great opportunities with skill development and opportunities for apprenticeships because actually, if you live in Corby, as I do, and Google apprenticeships, you will not find a quality apprenticeship in Corby being advertised. The pay is terrible, the, level, the levels are not very good, the training offer is not very good, the descriptions are terrible. When my son said, I'm not going on to university after finishing my A-levels, I'm going to look for apprenticeship, we started looking at relocation packages because he was never going to find a quality job in our town. So young people are disconnected from those vacancies and the opportunity for quality of work. So, so we have to hear that, and it's difficult. But we have to hear that so that in the conversations today and in the conversations going forward, those voices of our young people are part of our thinking. And we're not just putting tape over some of this, but we're taking meaningful action in how we might address those issues that young people are telling us about. I've run out of time. There's 160 odd pages for you to read, but also I'd urge you to come and talk to us about the work we're doing to improve quality of work with employers and generally how we're bringing that youth voice into everything that we do because I'd, I'd encourage you to think about it in your own organisations too. Thanks, Ollie. LJ, that was absolutely great. As always, it's always a pleasure working with you and your uh, amazing team. So yeah, I'd really recommend people come and say hello to one of the, one of the team today. I think some of the points that you made were really, really resonant. So um, it's, it's one that is oft said, but often for kind of forgotten, but young people are not homogenous. As policymakers, we often say young people, or we say um, LGBT young people, and we just have to remember that, yes, we have to aggregate sometimes to, to, to get to go forward, but yeah. it's really important to take that step. So I think that's a really important reminder. The mental health issues, um, and I think that links to something that I suspect we're going to hear a lot today, which is that kind of big inactivity issue. It's a horrible word because it's kind of very clinical DWP, but inactivity rather than necessarily unemployment yes. being one of the big messages about what we tackle. Uh, lack of work experience and the challenges that brings. I loved your point. It's sad, but I loved your point about difference meaning disadvantage here. Um, and actually, when we look at international comparisons, often difference in lots of ways is welcomed, yes. and it's one of the things that powers productivity, and yet it's something that here we're saying gives you a disadvantage, which is really, really sad. Um, and that, that point that you finished on around um, kind of preparation for work and work experience, there's never been a golden age. We all love sharing our experience of when we went into the careers office and we were told, in my case, that I should be a tree surgeon or an undertaker. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Had they met you? <laughs> I think it was one of those computer programs. But anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you for saying that. Um, uh, but yeah, I wondered just if you could finish, finish your little section on a positive note and just tell us a couple <laughs> of things that you would like to change about the system to try and get us more towards something that would help young people, particularly on that career side, to, to get ready for the opportunities that are out there and uh, to pick up those positive opportunities that Phil finished with um, that might be coming on the other side of the recession. Yeah, and I, th I think there is some positives, absolutely. And if I could have had another 10 minutes, Ollie, <laughs> I'd have finished with them. Um, I, th I think what, what we hear from young people is they really want these opportunities. They want to be in fulfilling roles. They want to be in good companies. They want to learn. They want to grow. They want to develop. We took two young people on for, for Kickstart who are, who are now just about to complete their apprenticeships with us because after Kickstart, we moved them into apprenticeships. And they're, they're desperate. What's next? What, what can we do? The next level apprenticeship? Can we do a degree apprenticeship? They're moving. And when I say we took them from Kickstart, these were young people whose levels of anxiety for one of them meant that she cried through her interview. In fact, I, I, I cleared the room so we could just have some one-on-one -on -one time because her anxiety was so debilitating. And for another member of staff, he, he, he doesn't speak. He, he cannot speak. He's so overwhelmed with fear that he cannot communicate. He now says, good morning, LJ, to me when he comes into the office. Like, and, and, but they are incredible at their jobs. These young people might face these barriers, might have this level of challenge, but they want to work through it. And in the right environments, with the right employers, with the youth-friendly culture around them, with the right training, the right learning, my goodness, they're exceptional. So, so that point about start investing in this youth audience, this, there's no better time. And I guess we will have to be ambassadors of that message that says to employers, 
okay, it's going to feel hard right now because of the economy, but with the, with the labor market as it is, this is the moment to look to that youth audience and to really invest in skills, training, development, mentoring, coaching. Because when you do that with those young people, I don't think my two young people are ever leaving. I probably won't <coughs> let them. But, you know, th that loyalty and that investment in our organization is, is so organic because of the journey they've come through. So I, th I think it's a real moment to go, let's put this effort into our young people and help them overcome their barriers together. Because largely, we've created the barriers because we're the grown-ups in the system. I love it. That's a really good place to finish. So uh, I'm going to go to the podium next okay. and pretend to be Lisa from NFER. Um, so we wanted, as well as talking about the current system uh, and the challenges and opportunities for employers and young people, to say a little bit about the future of skills. Um, Lisa, unfortunately, is not well this morning, but um, happily, I'm on the advisory group for this project. So um, I've got a few notes. Uh, bear with me. Uh, I might not answer my own difficult questions, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project. So. This is called Skills Imperative 2035. Uh, you'll see from the date that it's kind of forward-looking. Um, it's a project that's being led by our colleagues at the National Foundation for Educational Research and funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Um, what we started off looking at here is some of the kind of mega trends that won't come as a surprise, but I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of those. Um, they've been kind of behind what we've heard from Phil and LJ as well. Um, of course, COVID, as LJ said, that's the, the kind of one of the main things that's affected the, uh, the, the results of the youth census. Um, Brexit hasn't gone away, it got rather swept up by COVID, um, but I think we've seen that particularly in some sectors like healthcare and hospitality. The kind of strong advance of technology, and I'll say a bit about that because it's one of the key areas that we're looking at in this project. Uh, climate change, of course, and uh, a bit later on I'm going to be going across to another event, everything seems to be happening in Birmingham this week, but another event that we've got on looking at sustainability and climate change and how we're going to teach that in schools uh, and really support young people to, to, to take a positive view there. Um, and of course the demographic changes as well that particularly impact things like the care sector that we've featured in our skill shortage bulletin this time, uh, which is on your tables. So I think it's, it's an absolute truism that nobody has ever managed to predict the changes in the labor market perfectly, um, but that's not a get out of jail free card. We do need to do some thinking here because there are big trends that we can spot, there are changes that we can make, um, and also we can look at the kind of transferable and underlying skills that are gonna set up the kind of young people that LJ's just been talking about um, for the best possible situation that they can be. So this is a five-year research project. Um, the kind of key aims are kind of looking to identify those essential employment skills that young people are going to need for work in the future, looking at projecting the demand and the supply of essential employment skills for 2035, uh, drawing on findings from a, a new survey of, of essential employability skills, uh, and particularly looking uh, at the kind of the full working age population, 16 to, to 65 looking at the kind of key issue and challenge that we're seeing globally um, of uh, the areas that are most at risk of, uh, of challenge and automation and change from technology, um, and investigating how the kind of skills that we now, through this project, know that we need in 2035, how those are being embedded or not in the current education system. And that's definitely something that I'd like to pick up uh, with the panel shortly. So there have been two key publications from this piece of work so far. Um, the first was a really in-depth review um, of research and thought leadership in this space, um, looking at the kind of essential skills that might be needed over the next 15 years. So I wanted to share some of the key highlights from that. So uh, again, these, some of these are things that you'll, you'll know and they will come back and reinforce during the day, but I think it's important to, to share them kind of early on. So workers with lower levels of education or in lower skilled jobs um, are at the greatest risk of automation. Um, and uh, there will be some impact from artificial intelligence on higher level, higher skilled jobs, um, but those, those people are in the, in the biggest challenge. Uh, going back to linking with LJ's work, um, overwhelmingly it's younger people um, and also people from disadvantaged, uh, economically disadvantaged groups who are, who are currently occupying those jobs. The importance of kind of human reasoning and interaction, the things that robots can't do, um, is really expected to grow in areas like health, social care, and education, uh, and of course in, in the areas that respond to uh, the environmental challenges, so green technologies and, and the kind of jobs around that. There's a real urgency of action here, and I think we're hearing that through everything that we're, we're hearing this morning. Um, we've already seen uh, coming up for 2% of jobs in Europe in manufacturing uh, being automated, so there's already a direct impact there. Um, and uh, the kind of projections suggest that about 22% of jobs in current workforce activities across the EU could be automated by as soon as 2030. So um, this is a really kind of pressing challenge. 
Of course, the pandemic has really accelerated plans here, uh, and that was one of the kind of most challenging stats that, that we pulled out in actually in our previous skill shortage bulletin uh, was a global one looking at the number of companies that had accelerated their automation plans as a result of COVID. I guess thinking in a very economic sense that um, you know, it really brought home the fallibility of their kind of human workforce, um, uh, not so algorithms, and so they'd really accelerated their plans there. And some of the skills, again, that come out uh, time and again in this space that will be critical, problem solving, decision making, communication, critical thinking, uh, all the things that I think reassuringly we might also want in our family members, in our communities. Um, so whenever we're challenged to say, well, you, know, you don't want to just support young people to get ready for work, well, that's absolutely right. But actually the skills that they're going to need for the future of jobs are also probably the skills that they're going to need to be good human beings and good members of our society. The second publication recently from this piece of work uh, was looking at projections ahead um, into, into the UK economy. This was in partnership between NFER and uh, University of Warwick's uh, Centre for Employment Research. So I wanted to share a few findings from that as well. So good news, building on what Phil said earlier, they're predicting 2.6 million new jobs by 2035. Um, so there are opportunities coming on stream. Um, as LJ challenged us, we just need to help to connect those and to help get young people ready for those opportunities. Uh, employment in the health sector is particularly uh, likely to increase, as you will know from demographics and from the impact of, of the other trends that we've talked about, uh, around three and a half, three, 350,000 uh, new jobs by 2035. So that's a real growth area. Um, I think it's, it's a very challenging area. It was one of the ones that we pulled out in our um, most recent skill shortage bulletin that you have on your tables. Um, so there are already skill shortages there, but also great opportunities coming up. Almost all of those new jobs that will be created by 2035 will be in professional or associate professional occupations. Um, and uh, as we've seen, the jobs that are most vulnerable to automation are more likely to be held by, um, by young people. And also, interestingly, on the gender balance, more, more likely to be held by men. Some of the sectors which are likely to have the largest employment declines would include, as you might expect, manufacturing around things like metal products and transport equipment uh, with reductions of about 40,000 in each. Um, and interestingly, the paper kind of concludes by recommending that what we need here is a much more joined up approach from government. Um, we do a lot of work at EDGE around policy history. Uh, many of you remember the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. It wasn't perfect, but it did some of that work to draw this, this together and to have a single place where information about skill shortages, information about the changing economy is, is kind of happening. Um, the unit for future skills has been founded in the Department of Education. We think that's a really positive way forward, um, but potentially there could be more done there to really join this together. So, in just to finish off, a couple of products that are coming next in this space as, uh, as the reports come out from this project. Um, the first will be uh, a look at the um, future skills projections. Um, so, moving on from those kind of uh, job predictions to uh, looking at what might be needed in terms of skills. Um, and then finally, one of the big products at the end is going to be um, looking at skills measurement, uh, how that should be developed and integrated into the education system. So, starting to think about the impact of those and how we might get ready. So I hope Lisa, when she watches that video, doesn't think I did too bad a job. Um, but yes, we'll, we'll post any corrections under the video. Um, I'm not going to ask myself any questions because that would be weird. So we're going to move straight on to getting some responses from my fantastic colleagues on my right. So um, I'm going to welcome first, it's a pleasure, my colleague Kat Ems, who's one of our senior researchers at the Edge Foundation. Kat leads with me on producing the skill shortage bulletin. So we'd love to hear a bit about your reflections and how it connects to some of the wider messages, Kat. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our presenters today. They really highlight some of the key messages that we have featured in the skill shortages bulletins. We've done around 10 or 11 now, there's so much research out there and yeah, it's hard to condense it down into one bulletin each time. So yeah, consistent messages we're hearing, for example, from employers that they're, they're struggling to find the right skills to fill their vacancies as, as Phil highlighted. And we're consistently hearing the same messages about kind of, it's not just about the qualifications that they're coming out with, but it's a broader set of skills that they're looking for in their employees as well. So things like adaptability, uh, team working skills, um, problem solving skills, things like that. And as we heard from LJ as well, young people are having less opportunities to develop these type of skills in education as well. So there's a real mismatch between what employers are wanting and what young people are coming out of the education system with. And the pandemic has worsened that with um, the lack of information, advice and guidance and work experience as well that young people have had the opportunity to do. Um, so we try to include lots of perspectives. So we often hear from employers and it's great to hear from young people as well. 
but we also feature a piece from parents as well, which is often kind of a, a forgotten about group, but they're so important in terms of young people's decision-making process and kind of where they get their advice and guidance, actually one of the biggest influences for young people. Um, so Gatsby have done some research and they found that actually 71% of parents feel overwhelmed by the number of options available to their child. So we're seeing new qualifications as well coming in, T-levels, degree apprenticeships in the last few years. So there's a lot of information for parents to take in and trying to process and give it the right guidance for their young people. Um, they also found that 62% of parents admit to relying predominantly on their own experiences as well when offering recomm recommendations on potential future opportunities. So again, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the job market was a completely different place, the qualifications available, very different. Um, since in the last few years, we've seen a whole new array of career opportunities that are available things in the digital tech world with AI, thinking about sustainability um, jobs. And kind of also young people are much more like to be in a portfolio career or, or working in the gig economy. So all these different kind of job opportunities and ways of working are very different to when their parents perhaps were um, thinking about what their next steps were. So Gatsby advised, yeah, they shouldn't, they shouldn't stop parents discussing opportunities with their young people, it's in, uh, their children. It's important to be honest and open and have um, these discussions with their children, let them share their aspirations and show support. Um, but there are a lot of uh, resources available, and actually on the Gatsby website, they've created a whole suite um, of resources available for parents to support them to do that as well. Um, so also just to touch on some of the, the skill shortages across the sectors, we're, we're seeing vital industries across the economy um, struggling um, with growing skill shortages, so food production, construction, um, hospitality. Um, we also feature a piece this time on uh, health and social care. So we've seen, as Phil has highlighted as well, kind of the existing workforce are really um, having a, their mental and physical well-being is really being threatened by kind of the, the toll that um, the high staff turnover and the pressure on them and they're feeling those um, pressures massively. Um, and it's really uh, reaching crisis point in, in, for example, the NHS as well. Um, so it's really important to ensure that kind of the right education pathways and opportunities are available we're kind of seeing threats from uh, perhaps cuts to BTECs. Um, we use the really important qualifications for people, not just young people, but also adults who are looking to rescale and move into this sector. So it's really important that we keep enough kind of education um, opportunities open for these people. Um, just like to touch quickly as well on another sector that we feature in this bulletin around the film and TV industry. So it's not often. Um, one that we think about a lot, but um, it's actually a hugely growing um, industry in the UK. Over the last decade, it's grown significantly. Obviously, we've seen streaming services um, increase a lot, and there's a lot of hidden roles within that sector that uh, young people just don't understand and know about. So technical roles around the camera work and lighting, uh, grips, um, editors, and so on. And so uh, the research that's been done by film and screen industries found that um, a lot of young people in schools and also teachers and um, careers advider, advisors just aren't aware of kind of the breadth of role, roles that are available. Um, so yeah, a couple of pieces and you can read more in the skill shortages bulletins that are available here. That was great. Thank you so much, Kat. Yeah, I was reading yesterday that there was there are so many uh, fil like American films and series being shot in Halifax that they're renaming it Hollywood, which I thought was <laughs> I maybe a bit aspirational, but yeah, yeah, it does show that it's kind of coming coming to coming to Yorkshire at least. Um, I think your point about um, the kind of the, the number of bulletins we've done and how c consistent the messages um, mm. are is really important. Actually, uh, I think it's really clear that kind of employers, parents, young people, although it changes a little bit, like your point about mental health rising up, you know, broadly the messages have been the same for the last 20, 30 years about what we need to do. Mm. So I think that's kind of a sobering thought for, for policymakers. Um, I also liked your point about um, kind of parents as well, and just reminding us as well to 
continue to challenge misconceptions, as you were mentioning around young people, LJ. Um, you know, absolutely, we mustn't just use our own experience to, to kind of uh, inform. Um, but also, uh, you know, there are there are a lot of kind of societal hang-ups in this area, let's say, particularly with things like apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. Things have moved on quite a bit in terms of, um, you know, aspiration and, and kind of um, prestige for apprenticeships, but there's still a little bit of a, they're great, but not for my child. So I think it's mm -hmm. important that we continue to kind of, uh, you know, surface those and, and kind of gently uh, provide the evidence to show that they're maybe not, not true anymore. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kat. Um, we'd love to have a couple of uh, perspectives from the ground as well, so I'm gonna welcome James next. James Norris is assistant principal um, at Walsall College. Uh, th thanks, Ollie. There's a, there's a lot to take in there, isn't there? So I'm, I'm going to try and not sort of um, carry on sort of the doom and gloom. I'll try and put a positive spin, spin on to, to some of the things we've talked about today. But nevertheless, from a provider perspective, um, I was having a conversation with Phil as we were getting mic'd up earlier. And I think, you know, we've got the top line data and I think we can easily map from a, a further education college perspective you know, some of the issues and challenges that we've talked about this morning um, are existing in a lot of private training organisations. But I'll sort of reflect on a some and, and respond to some of those. I think um, the first thing is, thanks obviously for the data and the reports, because it supports us as providers to make a really, really good assumptions when we come to our planning, our curriculum planning and our forecast moving forward, whether that's further education colleges or independent training providers. Um, we very much recognise that lack of workforce planning with employers, uh, and I will challenge the room on this one. It's not just micro and small businesses that do not workforce plan. We have massive challenges with some of our larger levy paying organisations who, when we talk to them about what's next, when we talk to them about developing curriculum over time, there is a complete lack of understanding about where their gaps are in their workforces. Uh, apart from partners that we work with, like Balfour Beatty Vinci, <laughs> I, hasten, I hasten to add. So I think that we can't just always go to, oh, it's the micro and small businesses because they don't have the capacity. Yes, of course, they haven't got the resource that some larger organisations have. But we are seeing challenges now on the ground where we cannot transact with new government educational policies because of restrictions to capacity. And I'll give you one example of that. T-levels. Um, T-levels in construction are going well. T-levels in digital from the first phase were going well until remote working came about. Now we cannot find placements because in the digital market, a lot of companies have transitioned to remote working. How do you place a young person with an organization now that has got pretty much 100% of its workforce remote working from home? Very, very difficult. Although we did win a Beacon Award for our online work experience, so I'm very <laughs> proud of that. But when we come to things like health, some of the pathways in that, where we look at non-clinical wards, we get really good work experience opportunities. Where we look at those wards that are really under pressure, maternity, for example, those hospitals, those trusts can just not accommodate those work experience placements. So just to throw that out there today, I haven't got the answer, but it's going to be a challenge for the T-level agenda moving forward. On the flip side of that, parents, they are massive stakeholders. Um, I'm going back to the college this afternoon. We've got a big open evening. I will present to lots of young people and their parents. I ask the question when we come to the slides, how many people in the room get A-levels? Nearly every hand goes up. How many people understand apprenticeships? Pretty much nearly hand, ha every hand goes up in the room. What about T-levels? Nothing. So there's a massive piece of work to do from government and local provider context and other stakeholders to support that T-level agenda. Just coming back to Laura's commentary, uh, we have seen over the last 12 months since COVID huge spikes in uh, safeguarding and mental health referrals. Now, two ways we can look at this. One is there's a positive because our reporting mechanisms are probably improved, so it's about recognising and actually being able to take action. But from a provider perspective, it puts huge pressure on us from a resource capacity to manage those caseloads and managing that stakeholder piece around making sure that we actually get to the nub of the issue when it comes to those safeguarding and mental health issues and actually do something about it. Just things like special exam arrangements that we've had to make for those with anxiety has meant additional and substantial costs on us as a provider. So again, I'll just put that out there as challenges from a funder's perspective, and some of my commissioners are in the room, so <laughs> hello, Claire. Um, but, and, and that's not just for young people. We're seeing more and more uh, adults 
uh, and particularly those in-work adults for apprenticeships that are taking breaks in learning for mental health and breaks from work. So again, we, we need to have a look at that. Just a positive reflection, and then I'll shut up and let, uh, let others come in, let Naomi come in. I think COVID and post-COVID has driven us as partners on the ground to more collaborative working. I think um, we, we had to all come together during COVID and do something fairly rapidly. Uh, sometimes it was clunky, but I think we've maintained relationships that we developed during COVID that are, are now paying dividends in the post-COVID skills and employability world. Um, from that perspective, Warsaw, for those of you that have read the Leveling Up white paper, appears in there on 23 occasions, um, <laughs> and we are one of three Pathfinder regions uh, across England. And that Pathfinder region uh, comes with no money, so there is no additional money, but what there is is there's a willingness on the ground to try and do something different, to really make a difference and put some legacy in place. I don't think those partnerships would have been there if we hadn't have all been forced together during COVID to do something uh, in order to help coming out of that post-COVID landscape. So as a positive, I think there is better partnership working on the ground. So I am hopeful that whether the recession, I'm hoping it will be uh, shorter and less deep than everybody projects. But I think there's a really good baseline there to start to do some good work uh, in order to support skills and employability moving forward. And I'll shut up. James, thank you so much for lifting the mood. That was absolutely great. Uh, and last but not least, we've captured a, a real employer. So uh, Naomi Bates is business partner for education and careers uh, at Balfour Beatty Vinci. Thank you. So yeah, I work at Balfour Beatty Vinci. We're working on the HS2 project in the West Midlands area. Um, and I just want to reflect on, obviously, the point you just made, James, about workforce planning um, and link it to Laura's point about investment because it does take time. Um, so we have partnered with Warsaw College on the T-level programme, um, but, you know, it does take time. So those students are on a two-year programme and we were part of the pilot. Uh, we also had COVID restrictions on there as well. Um, so I was eagerly awaiting to get these students on placement because I know how important it is to get that face-to-face -face interaction, which I think reflects back to, LJ, your point about, you know, if it is online, how they're getting that interaction and developing those essential skills. So I did manage to get all the 45 days in, you know, with those COVID restrictions when it was safe to do so. And out of the cohort, I can successfully say seven of those got apprenticeship opportunities with BBV. So it really allowed us to assess that future talent. Um, and, you know, it got them to adapt and get those skills. And it makes them, you know, they weren't ready, interview ready. Um, yes, not everyone in the cohort wanted an apprenticeship, but some have gone on to further education. Um, and they're still aligned to skill shortage areas. So there was a lot of architects in there that have gone on to university. And I've still extended my offer to those students to come back for some summer placements. So for me, it was a real investment opportunity. Um, and now I've extended my offer, so I've got another cohort, haven't I? I've got yeah. students out on placement at the moment, as well as working with other colleges in the West Midlands. And as you said, I'm, I'm looking at other T levels. So yeah, the digital. Because, um, you know, we're not just construction, we have other support functions. Um, so for me, the T-level has been a fantastic way to invest and develop young people. So I can't recommend um, them enough, but it does require planning. So I think that, yes, you can't think, when you think about workforce planning, that was two years in the making to get those apprentices in the business. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Naomi. That's absolutely great. Um, we've got time for a, a couple of themes. So I'm going to pick up a, a few things with the, with the wider panel. Uh, and I'm giving uh, the panel a bit of a heads up that we're going to finish with asking you for uh, kind of one, one key change that you'd like to see in the kind of educational skills system to try and make things a positive. So I'll let that mull in the back of your mind. But I wanted to pick up that great point from, uh, that, that Naomi's finished with there. It was like one of the key messages from all of our skills shortage bulletins, Cat, has been the importance of those kind of transferable skills. Mm. Um, it feels like the way to get those transferable skills is to get some experience at the workplace um, and then it feels like uh, we've got some brilliant examples like, like Naomi's but actually a lot of employers are not yet kind of in that space. Some of the key messages we, we hear and we, that we picked up in the bulletin are the complexity of the system, the fact that um, there's not kind of a, a single organization in, in the role that education business partnerships used to play in, in every area to kind of corral those um, opportunities together and so a lot of businesses are facing kind of lots of multiple requests. So I wanted to just kind of bring that in and see, you know, Phil, maybe you could start us. Is that something that you have seen from, from employers coming through as a challenge? How could we kind of try and get, try and really kind of get a, an army of work experience placements or work placements uh, out there? What a great question. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I 
Do you know what? I mean, it, it's so difficult for employers because there's so much complexity in the system and there's so much that needs to be done. And we've just heard it today. You know, things have become really more complex around the mental health well-being side as well. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I was speaking yesterday on a social mobility uh, webinar for the Diversity and Social Mobility Forum for Apprenticeships. And one of the things that strikes me is that we, we need to remember that the nature of jobs is changing. You, you talked about, you know, the report that you, you were covering. The skills we're going to need are changing, and we shouldn't make any assumptions as employers or providers of education or, or whatever we're doing, any assumptions about people who happen to be in low-skilled, low-education jobs. We should start with the assumption that everyone has talent that can be developed and can be developed in the right way, if they're given the right opportunity. And we need to make sure that the whole way we approach skills in this country aligns itself to give people opportunity. It doesn't matter what that answer specifically is, but it allows them to do that. I think we need a skill system that focuses on opportunity and gives people opportunity regardless of their background, their community, their limitations, the nature of work they're currently in, because life is going to be different. The jobs are different, the nature of work is different, mm. the nature of how we deliver skills is going to be different. We need to focus on what that future is going to be and give everyone an opportunity. So that's a very generic answer, but I, that, I'm quite passionate about that. I think that's really important for us yeah. to not get stuck in old thinking about where people are and what the jobs are that they're in. Yeah, I absolutely love that point. And, and there's so much in that around even just the language that we use. You know, we talk about low-skilled jobs, uh, young people with low aspirations. It, it all just sticks, doesn't it? It builds up and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, James, I wanted to come to you next. You, you gave a little sneaky throwaway there that you won a Beacon Award that actually Edge sponsored, um, and that was for a program around uh, virtual work experience. I couldn't resist yeah. grabbing hold of that. Is, that, that, is yeah. that one opportunity here to make things a little bit easier? Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, you know we, we, we talked a lot during the pandemic. You know, uh, providers um, ac across the country did a Herculean task that when, when we got that lockdown notification, we sort of switched everything on, online, didn't we? And I, I agree with Phil. Some of it was pretty much going onto Teams and just doing a PowerPoint presentation by sharing your screen. But then a lot of good providers then have taken that to the next level. They've adapted that. They've adapted that teaching and learning on, online. They've, they've, and the important bit is they've reskilled, developed their own teaching staff to be able to do that really, really well. But from a work experience perspective, I, I, I think that that can be a really good tool to, to, to utilize to break down some of those barriers where, you know, uh, young people might find it difficult to travel to the workplace because of challenges around cost. Or, you know, one of my employers said to me, "We need to do it online, James, because I want to recruit young people. But the only place they can get, the only way they can get to us is with a car. They haven't got a driving license. They can't afford a car insurance, so they're not going to travel there. So that's a really good way to break mm. down project-related learning. So I think it's something we could grab hold of and actually develop even further. That's great, and and some flexibility, hopefully, from government around the placements in industries that are overwhelmingly uh, digital, uh, being uh, digital absolutely. themselves. Absolutely, and and just just and just a little bit, just a little bit more of an understanding of, um, you know, we, we talk about an uh, employer-led system, don't we? But the challenges on those employers at the moment, look, it, it means they cannot come to the table. They haven't got the time and resource and capacity to be able to lead on that. So it's about that collaborative understanding of removing those barriers in the best way forward, mm. for, in the best interest of meeting those mm. skills needs. That's really helpful, James. Um, Kat, you've just published some research looking at some of the kind of impact of COVID uh, in some specific instances around, around the UK. Can you say a little bit about that and whether there are some opportunities there from kind of online learning and the pandemic mm. to, to improve things? Yeah, so uh, we actually did some research looking at how vocational courses are being taught through the pandemic. So obviously a lot of these courses were struggling. A lot of it is practical, uh, hands-on experiences. But we did see some um, good examples of where um, the learning was taking place online um, in creative ways. So, um, for example, fashion students doing something on their own at home, but then using the online tools um, as a communication tool to kind of showcase what they're doing um, and kind of get that feedback uh, from their peers and from teachers as well. So there's definitely a place for online learning um, for some of the kind of also more theory side of things. But uh, what we really found from this research is how important it is for young people to be together in the classroom, uh, collaborating with each other, um, being able to practice those practical skills in the classroom. Um, and then being able to use that time perhaps online for the more theory things or, or as communication tools in other ways. So, yeah, real mix we saw of how 
some things could adapt to online delivery, but not, not everything. Mm, that's really helpful, Kat. Um, LJ, I wanted to ask you about how we get young people. So if we, if we, get, this, if we get employers more engaged, have more opportunities, um, how can we best prepare young people for those? Obviously, there's a challenge of confidence, there's a challenge of communication in some, place, in some cases. We want them to get the most out of those opportunities. How do we, how do we get them into the best place to kind of seize them? God, that's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> um, I, th I think there's some interesting things in that. We, we provide at Youth Employment UK, we provide online careers information, support on skills and virtual work experiences to young people to get them started. We have about two million young people a year come and use our website and those resources. They're looking for that information to connect to those opportunities and to build their skills. You know, one of the most um, common pages that young people come onto on our website is how do I develop my teamwork skills? Because they're thinking about that first CV, that first job mm -hmm. application, and they're looking for that insight. So, so digital, I think blended is right, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a safe place for young people when it's a good quality resource to start. But I would say in the census, young people want face to face. We cannot underestimate the power of that connection. And even, you know, we, we took on two apprentices in lockdown and we, gosh, we had to work hard to support them and to develop their skills. There were those water cooler moments that were missed. And, and we, were, we were working with them night and day to make sure that they didn't miss out on those opportunities. But it's really difficult. And young people need people. Mm. You know, the loneliness spike is because they're not getting face-to-face -face opportunities. So, so we, the blended is important. I guess how we prepare young people, I do think that... We're seeing a real shift, you know, in, in the careers information system and the support that's coming from schools. I think the work at Gatsby and the careers and enterprise company in terms of getting more schools to do career leader training and have that dedicated careers leader is starting to feed through. We saw this year young people heard about apprenticeships more than they've ever done before in the census. So we know that that information is getting through. I think what it is is about consistency and we talk a bit, we're, we're partners with WMCA and we were talking with Claire this week about you know, what gets measured gets done, but actually there's also the point that those around us that have got the power to influence have to use it better. Uh, so if you're an employer like Balfour BT, you know, make sure your programs are youth friendly, that you're doing the good work, you've used the evidence of what works, and then go beat the down door of a school, a college, <laughs> and make sure that they are making those connections properly. I'd say young people want it, young people are looking for it, we just need that system to better align, I think. Thanks, RJ. And Naomi, you're obviously, BT Vinci is a really kind of visible brand. You must get a lot of kind of requests for work experience and placements. What, what kind of makes you more likely, what kind of reassures you and think, yeah, we're going to take that one? And what kind of might be more of a challenge if a school came to you and kind of made an ask? What, what kind of gets things to the top of your inbox? Um, so for me, it's all about giving a meaningful placement. So I don't mind if a student doesn't know what they want to do. I'd rather them come in and explore that opportunity. We know we've got a skill shortage area. Um, I do just want to touch upon the virtual work experience because it is something that I've ran, but I think it is probably a bit of education with young people about online etiquette because they are quite shy and they won't interact even by putting their camera on or mic. And I think that's what the face-to-face -face work placement gives them. It gives them that travel, you know, I need to get to that place and it builds a lot more skills. But I do think there is a place for virtual work experience. But I think there needs to have that face-to-face -face element in there as well, because ultimately we are adapting as a business and there is a lot of homework in, but that young person needs that interaction at the beginning and they need to see role models as well. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So yeah, hybrid is definitely the way forward. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together, so I just wanted to gather up our thoughts uh, on a positive note about the kind of one change we might want to see, and I'll work my way across in the way we spoke, so I thought maybe we could come to you first. I've just changed my mind what I'm going to say. Oh, great. I, I've just, I, when LJ said then about you know, employers making the most of the, the opportunities and the resources they've got, it's, it's made me think of something that I think is, 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 is not widely known, is worth stating. The Open University, we've got a partnership with Uber, um, and Uber as a brand has, has got its problems, you know, its strengths and weaknesses. But what they've done, they've taken the opportunity to offer their drivers education as part of their benefits package. And they've got a driving community that's from a very, very diverse set of communities, including many refugees, for example, but also other diverse communities. And they've taken the opportunity of offering that benefit to their drivers and said they can pass it on to their families. That's genuine social mobility. 
I love it. I was actually, I had an Uber driver yesterday morning I was going to the station, he was telling me about the MBA he was working on with the OU, so live. Um, I don't know, how cool is that? Did you plan that? No, I didn't even, no, yeah, exactly. Just, just serendipity. Um, LJ, what would your one change be? Oh, because I'm naughty, I've got two. Um, the first is, we're, as I say, we're working with WMCA. I think the devolution agenda is really exciting. I think that local place-based approach is, is got so much opportunity to it. I think we need to really develop and learn that practice and support kind of um, national government to really think about place-based work mm -hmm. and place-based support systems for, for young people. Um, so I think there's some really interesting things coming, but I would like to see it accelerated. And my second one, because I'm naughty, is I don't think that we should be making decisions for young people without young people. And I think there should absolutely be some work that's done to ensure that if you're creating new employability programs, you're creating new curriculums, you're creating new standards, we had the employer-led standards. Not a young person was sat at a table for employer-led standards, yet they were the consumer. Mm. So I think, I think we have to flip some of that accountability from us back to what young people want to see, or, or let them hold us accountable mm -hmm. to the skills and training system of which they're consumers. That'd be really interesting. Love it. That was such a good point you're allowed to. Um, Kat, what would yours be? Um, mine would be, well, I, it's been really worrying recently seeing the number of schools that are cutting subjects like design and technology, arts, music, and so on, all these kind of subjects that aren't seen as essential. Um, and I think it's really important that we, we fund these and give them the proper resource so that young people have the opportunity to do a broad uh, range of subjects. And these are the kind of subjects that really develop those skills that employers are looking for, like um, the technical skills and the creativity and the team working skills that these subjects uh, offer. So, yeah, bringing back these subjects into the curriculum, I think. Love it. That's absolutely great and uh, very topical. I didn't plan that either, <laughs> but we'll be launching a campaign in January called Save Our Subjects to try and uh, rally behind those subjects which are important for the economy, important to find young people's talents, but are sadly dropping off the curriculum. James, what would your change be? Uh, I, think, I think mine would be a, a call to action. Um, uh, you know, inevitably we're going to go through, a dif employers are going to go through a, a, a difficult couple of years. Um, you know, I, I sit on a, a Black Country Chamber think tank board and I can already see that employers are worrying about obviously cost of materials, cost of supply, et cetera, et cetera. And that skills piece is sort of going down the ladder again. My call to action would be is for employers to get really close, maybe give some time up, like Naomi has, to work with your local college, your training provider, to really help us transact and help that curriculum design, that forward planning, that support for where you've got short-term vacancies that we can potentially help uh, fulfill and access and support our young people and adults to those jobs and higher levels of education. So my ask would be, employers, please get involved with your, with your, uh, your training partner. Nice, a really rich and meaningful engagement, not just kind of offering yeah. one placement, but yeah. maybe helping to plan, helping to give live project briefs, all of those. Absolutely, those and it's really not rich. just, a, we're, we're not just there, you know, from, we're not just saying to you from a transactional point of view, everybody defaults to, uh, well, I can't take on an apprentice, we're not asking for that. Just come in and talk to us, come and speak to young people about the experiences of working with your org organisation, whether that's a micro business or a large, it, it absolutely means so much to that group of young people and actually then de helps develop and underpin those skills. Great, James. And Amy, your, your wish. <laughs> I think it's all about that alignment to the opportunities and that investment piece. And I suppose for me, my wish from schools is to more curriculum time, especially with COVID. I have seen a reduction in that, in going in and, you know, aligning the work, the real world of work with what they're studying um, and work experience, because a lot of them have removed work experience from the curriculum. So then I'm trying to put it in half terms and holidays. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really important asks. Wonderful. Well, we've kicked off with some themes which I know are going to come back throughout the day. We wish you a really excellent rest of your day. And I just wanted to finish with a big round of applause for my fantastic panel. Thank you so much.